James Lloyd McIntyre. I was born July 12, 1926 in Winnipeg. I think uh, if you looked around town, you'd be hard pressed to find too many things, too many developments that uh, Jim McIntyre hasn't had uh, something to do with. Uh, even where we're sitting right now on the waterfront in an apartment, it could have been a tank farm or a pile of coal if it uh, hadn't been for, for his initiatives. And uh, the other day when I was uh, driving over the International Bridge, I was thinking uh, that I was going to be talking with a man who both had something to do with uh, having that bridge built and is still uh, sitting on the commission that runs it and is planning a uh, uh, new developments on the uh, Canadian Bridge Plaza. So uh, my first question for Jim is, uh, how did you get here from Winnipeg and start doing all these things? Well, I was working for it was then TCA, Trans Canada Airlines. And I was transferred here from the one year I had spent in Toronto. And I got here on the 14th of June, 1947. I was age 20. And within a week, I was advised the boat club was the place to go because that's where the girls were. And the first night I went there, I met Mary Gallivan. Two years later, we were married, and we subsequently had six children and then 15 grandchildren. And that first year at the boat club, I was elected treasurer of the club, and the next year I was the president. And I had never worked with groups before, and I was fascinated by the opportunity to meet some other people and see how groups work together. And that's sort of where I, where I got the itch. <laughs> and you, you threw yourself into your new community, really. Uh, you were involved in all sorts of uh, organizations, service clubs, and that sort of thing. Well, I guess uh, if you're looking at it in terms of my short political career, <laughs> Uh, I was a member of the Kinsman Club, then the Kiwanis Club, and I was on the Children's Aid Board and the Chamber of Commerce Board. And I had run across Del Lamont, who had lived across the street from me when I was in May Gearhart's boarding house at 26th to Drive. And one day he asked me if I would accept an appointment by the separate school board, of which he was chairman, to the Board of Education. So I said, sure, why not? So from there, a couple of years later, uh, I was a friend of Frank Iani, and I'd gone home to PEI to visit my parents. And when I got off the plane at the Sioux, there was an announcement that I should call Frank Iani. So I phoned him. I said, what's up, Frank? And he was an alderman. He said, there's a vacancy in Ward 1, and we've had you nominated to run for that vacancy. Well, I said, I don't live in Ward 1, I live in Ward 2. He said, that doesn't matter. He said, you've got till such and such a time to get over to City Hall and sign the papers. So on my way home, I dropped into City Hall to Harold Tolley's office and I signed the papers. And I went home and I said, I'm running for City Council. I got that look. <laughs> and I did and I was elected. And that was sort of the start of it. And uh, two years later, Mayor Walter Harry, who was Alec Harry's father, was retiring. And various people were going to seek the office. So one night I said to Frank, I don't think I'm interested in staying on city council with any of those guys. Well, he said, why don't you run for mayor? If you're defeated, it's just like retiring. That'll be the end of it. So I kind of liked the logic. I said, OK, I'll do that. So I ran for mayor, and I was elected. Well, imagine the surprise of my wife who said, now you're the mayor. <laughs> and so I served a two-year term and then I was reelected and served another two-year term. And then the city was ordered to amalgamate with Cora and Taryn Torres. And we were only given a one-year term in which to sort some things out before amalgamation occurred. And that's when I retired. Because at this point, uh, the oldest of our children was going into high school and we had three others in school, and Mary had two at home. And I said, well, 
this is enough. <laughs> uh, she's carried too much of a load over these years. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of my political career. <laughs> well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've heard that uh, you ran fairly low-key uh, campaigns when you did run for mayor. Small scale. Uh, well, when I ran as an alderman, I didn't have a campaign, really. Uh, mm -hmm. And my first campaign for mayor, I didn't have a committee room or didn't raise any money. Uh, but I, you know, I kept getting elected, so, you know, why make any more of this than you have to? <laughs> it was working. <laughs> and, and there's a story, I think, that, that uh, on election night, you didn't go to the campaign room directly. You went out to a movie or something like that? And I went for a long walk, as a matter of fact. Uh, one night I went for that long walk with one of your colleagues, uh, Dave Robertson. Oh, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I just showed up a little later uh, for the celebration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you, you didn't waste any time when you were in office, and, and I think you had a reputation for running a, a little tighter ship than we sometimes see these days at the city council. Is that fair? Or, uh, Yes, I think that is. Uh, but I had really good people to work with. Uh, I was blessed with uh, some terrific people on council. Uh, uh, Tom Angus uh, was uh, very bright, uh, uh, witty. Everybody loved him. And I had some good ward aldermen. Walter Chisholm was uh, a pal of mine. Uh, he was terrific. He, he would just do anything for his constituents. Uh, he was a little off the wall on a couple of subjects. He always voted against daylight saving time. <laughs> and he thought fluoridation was a plot to kill the masses. But other than that, he was a good guy. And I had other good people to work with. Uh, we never met after 11 o'clock. And uh, we pretty well stuck to business. Uh, I think the meetings were generally, uh, sure, I, I admit they were run pretty tight, but they were congenial. I don't think there were any subjective attacks one on another. Uh, we pretty well stuck to focusing on whatever the agenda item was. Mm -hmm. And your councils uh, accomplished huge things, really. It was a, a period of transition for the Sioux. You mentioned amalgamation, which was more or less outside uh, your realm where you just had to deal with it, but yeah. there's the bridge. We could talk about that if you like. Well, I think the, one of the more interesting developments with the bridge, first of all, it was a, a rite of passage when you were elected mayor. You were given the opportunity to buy a share in the St. Mary's River Bridge Company, mm -hmm. and you became a director of the company. Mm -hmm. So I parted with my $10 and became a shareholder. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, I've been with it since 1960, so I don't know how to quit. <laughs> and uh, one of the more interesting developments was uh, John Curran and I were invited to the Premier's office. Mr. Curran was uh, the president of the Chamber of Commerce and the editor of the paper. And he and I went to Toronto on the first flight in the morning. And we were met at the airport by the Premier's limousine, driven straight to Queen's Park. And we were introduced to the Premier and the Minister of Highways and the Treasurer of Ontario. And Premier Frost said, now, gentlemen, we're all busy. Let's get right down to business here. And he said, if you people think the city would support the Huron Street location for a bridge, you're going to hear an announcement very soon. But if you'd prefer some other location, it might take a while. <laughs> uh, so what do you think? So Mr. Curran was a senior to me by some years, and I expected him to respond. He said, no, you answer. I said, Mr. Curran and I think the Huron Street location is perfect. He said, gentlemen, let's go to lunch. <laughs> we never again talked about the bridge. <laughs> when it was opened uh, two years later, he and Governor Romney were at a dinner at the Armories with some 800 people, and I was asked to chair that dinner, and there I was sitting with George Romney on one side and Leslie Frost on the other, wondering, how did you get here? 
and uh, so you think it's the right location then. <laughs> Well, you could have built a cheaper bridge by mm -hmm. hopscotching it across Sugar Island, mm -hmm. technically, mm -hmm. but the traffic engineers, Coverdale and Coal Pits from the States, mm -hmm. had done a study of traffic on the ferry, and their opinion was that 70% of the non-commercial traffic would be local, and if we built the bridge too far away in terms of the Sioux at the time, it might discourage traffic. So that was the reason why the Huron Street was preferred. Mm. The, the city buses, for example, used to go only as far east as Pine Street. Mm. So anything that would have hopscotched across Sugar Island would have wound up somewhere near Garden River. Mm -hmm. And that was considered out in the boonies. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of swamp out there in those <laughs> days, yeah. And uh, how does it feel now? That, I mean, I'm sure you never dreamed that you'd still be involved with the bridge and uh, how does it feel now to be working on a, a major reconstruction at this end? And, well, I've mm -hmm. maintained my interest in that project. Uh, mm -hmm. I got into a lot of other things in the meantime, but uh, mm -hmm. that's really the only one that I've stayed with. Mm -hmm. I got uh, into a couple of things and one thing seemed to lead to another. The two main areas that I was involved in were uh, the police on one side and health care on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been a member of the police commission as the mayor. That was a statutory appointment. And coinciding with my retirement as mayor, a vacancy occurred on the police commission. And Art Wishart asked me if I would accept an appointment to was, stay on the commission. He was the attorney general at he that was. time? He yeah. was. So I stayed on the commission for 23 years. And uh, that led to an appointment. Uh, I was on the Ontario Police Task Force in the 70s with study policing all over Ontario and elsewhere. And then I was appointed to the Police Arbitration Commission. Their job was to select arbitrators to resolve disputes between police associations and commissions. And I became president of the Association of Police Commissions in Ontario. Hmm. And on the healthcare side, I started by being a director of the General Hospital, and I was on that board as long as the bylaws provided, which was 12 years, and I was chair for a couple of years. And that led to an appointment to the District Health Council, which I was on for eight years, and I chaired that for a couple of years. Then I was appointed to the Ministry of Health Committee on Assistive Devices, and then I was on Premier Peterson's Council on Health Strategy. So one thing led to another, and the years went on. Yeah, sounds like a, <coughs> a pattern of starting at a lo in a local small-scale thing and then being uh, drawn out into the provincial uh, field. It, it was <coughs> really exciting because uh, I'm a big believer in networking. And uh, at these other organizations, you got to meet people with other problems similar to your own, but from far distant parts of Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, you pick up a lot of good ideas. Uh, policing, I, I think you mentioned, is a family tradition there. My father was an inspector in the Winnipeg Police Department. He was a teacher by profession, but he wasn't able to get a job in Winnipeg as a teacher, and he took a job in a remote part of, Mather, of Manitoba, but he stayed, uh, well, his whole working career on the Winnipeg Police Force. And I have a grandson who's in the policing program at a community college, so I hope he carries <laughs> it on. That would be, that would be great, yeah. Um, policing changed uh, quite a bit over the years that, that you were involved, just even just locally. Uh, they used to, police used to do a lot of writing parking tickets and mm. checking meters and that sort of yeah. thing, I think. And, and did you have to, uh, were you steering uh, a lot of that modernization? Well, some of it happened uh, because uh, our chiefs belonged to associations and they knew what was going on elsewhere and the technology was changing. I'll tell you one thing I did learn. The city badly needed a police station and mm. what had happened was they had a referendum 
on building a police station and it was defeated. So the city built one that was, I think, completely inadequate at the time. And I thought, well, that's the last time you're ever going to see a referendum. The council is going to make the decisions, <laughs> and if the people don't like it, they can toss the rascals out. We never had another referendum. <laughs> uh, the other thing I learned was, uh, I learned this at almost the first meeting I attended, the chief used to come before city council and beg to have X number of cars replaced. And uh, the fleet around the time was about eight cars, and six of them should have been off the road. <laughs> And he'd ask for six cars. They'd never give him what he needed. They'd give him four. So he was limping along with four that were wrecks. Mm -hmm. So early on in my first year on the commission, I said, we've got to stop this. You're never going to get what you ask for, I'll tell you that. That's too big a target. <laughs> they, they see, you know, a new Chev is worth $4,000, and you want eight of them. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money. I said, you should sell the whole fleet of scrap you've got and lease your cars. It's going to cost you more money, but every year you'll have new cars. You'll never have to go back before a council. <laughs> as far as I know, they still lease part of that fleet. Yeah, yeah well, so do a lot of people have <laughs> learned that lesson, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, on the police commission, I think you ran into a little bit of controversy uh, because of your position at Algoma Steel. Is the, uh, you were... Um, Assistant superintendent in personnel or a superintendent at that time? I was an assistant, yes. Yeah. I worked for Jack O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we ran into that. Uh, when there was a strike, there was a mob at the gate, mm -hmm. and uh, there was conflict between whether the police had a role. But the commission has no authority to give direction to the police. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's crystal clear that if there's any attempt to give them direct direction, it has to be reported. So I wasn't involved in day-to-day -day policing activities. That no. was the responsibility of the chief. Mm -hmm. But whatever happened, uh, whether it was approved by the community or not, uh, I was a target, and sometimes <laughs> I was blamed for it. Mm -hmm. But that comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that there was any lingering? Uh, that was sort of a, I, I believe it was some kind of a, a labor group that was uh, opposing your position uh, on the police commission. Did, 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 did that persist, or is that pretty well over with? with well, I think track? it did hurt me in one sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I made a big mistake later on, I think it was in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I ran again for office, uh, for the office of mayor, and I think I had a lot of that baggage mm -hmm. from previous activities at the plant gates and so on, and, and I, was, I was defeated. But that's the way it goes. Uh, Mayor Turbovich was elected, and, uh, oh, yeah. and I think he did a nice job. He was on my council when I was uh, mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, you win some and you lose some. But I think <laughs> uh, whatever reputation I might have gained because I was chairman of the police commission, mm -hmm. let's put it this way, it didn't help me politically. <laughs> uh, so that was sort of the, the, the last gasp uh, in terms of seeking elected office. Mm -hmm. But you continued as the uh, head of the police commission for many years, so obviously... Uh, I did. I was, uh, I was there until the early 80s. And what happened there was uh, they were going to introduce term limitations. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there was only one other person in Ontario who had been on a police commission longer. And I said, well, I'm not going to get dumped because there's some bureaucratic rule. I'm going to resign, which is what I did. Huh. Hmm. Huh. Uh, getting back to uh, your years on the hospital, uh, that was the uh, the general hospital. Yes. And uh, did amalgamation happen while you were uh, there? or No, it didn't, but uh, I think I did help a little bit. Uh, there were conversations back and forth between the hospitals, and there always had been, mm -hmm. but they were looking for somebody who would chair a committee. And uh, Gordy Cunningham was a friend of mine, and he, he had been the president of the plumber. Later, he became the president of the Ontario Hospital Association. Mm -hmm. And then he retired as an optometrist and became the general manager of the Ontario Hospital Association. So he was very knowledgeable. And he was a terrific guy, uh, strictest integrity, very bright. People got along with him. He got along with others. 
So one day at a general hospital board meeting, I said, I got the guy that can chair this meeting that will have everybody's respect. So uh, I, they said, who's that? And I said, Gordy Cunningham. Mm -hmm. They said, well, don't you know he had been the president of the Plummer Hospital? <laughs> and uh, one of the sisters present said, he'd do the job, and he did. <laughs> so that was my little contribution. Mm -hmm. What went on was after my day on the board. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that stands out from the period then that uh, major accomplishment or? Well, <clears throat> I like to be associated with what happened on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, the waterfront of the day was, uh, I think you said in your intro, that we're mm -hmm. filming this uh, at a location that was probably once a tank farm mm -hmm. uh, or a coal pile. And that's what the waterfront was like. Uh, there were piles of wood and coal and what have you, plus the ferry dock, of course. And I remember going to the president of Algoma Steel. When you were mayor, you could get to see anybody. Uh, you'd phone somebody up and say, I'd like to speak to Mr. Holbrook. When can you get here? I mean, it was that easy. So I went to see him, and I was making a pitch for uh, the Flutie Report was, was underway, an urban renewal study. So I went to Mr. Holbrook, and I said, it's, it's pretty clear that someday you're going to have to replace the Cornwall building. It won't last forever. And why don't you do it on the waterfront? It could be a great location, good for your investors, good for your customers. And uh, he said, well, we got a lot of things on our plate. He said, that's nowhere near the top of the list. And he sort of brushed me off very politely. Then I went to see Lassois, who was the president of the ACR. And I said, you've got a lot of this land and you're not using it to its full value at all. So I said, why don't you do something on the waterfront? Start developing it for commercial use or whatever. And he wasn't the least bit interested in the idea. What changed there was that Len Savoy replaced him. And he had been an accountant by profession, and he worked for a consulting firm. I think it was Woods Gordon. And he saw the opportunities, and the result was Station Tower, the Delta Hotel, Station Mall. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. It was Len Savoy. And other things happened along the waterfront as well. Eventually, the condominiums and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, the but planning board uh, under Homer Foster, actually, was chairman. Uh, they had a lot to do with this, and the Flutie report focused on the waterfront mm -hmm. because Flutie had had an experience in Windsor, which helped to transform that waterfront. So that is something that happened, and I had a bit to do with it. Uh, well, I think but everything that, all the decisions are made, not by me, but by council. I mean, I had a chance to kind of point the way, but it was council that supported these things, and they get to make the decisions, not the mayor. Yeah, but but you were a, a big promoter of it. Well, and, it, yeah. it helped, yeah. yeah. Uh, looking at what's here now, is is this sort of what, what you envisioned, or...? Uh, no, I take real satisfaction in it. It's, it's better than it was, and I think that's why we're <laughs> sent here, you know, to, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, from what I've read that, that you were sort of, your vision of the waterfront was that private developers would mostly carry the ball. As you mentioned, you talked to the ACR and, uh, and Algoma Steel and people like that. Uh, a lot of the development down here that stands out is, is more public? Well, some of it is. Uh, uh, the library was the city's centennial project. Mm -hmm. That was kind of an interesting thing because that decision was made by the council of the last year I was there. In 1964, we had to make a decision on what the centennial project would be. And uh, the Carnegie Library on Queen Street uh, had been seriously uh, less than we needed. Mm -hmm. And I knew the chairman of the library board, it was Ken Clark, and I said, uh, are you game for promoting a new library as a centennial project? He said, oh, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Angus was a supporter of that project. His wife was on the library board. Mm -hmm. And I remember Ken Clark saying, we're going to do what we think council might approve. I said, don't do that. I said, what we want from the library board is what you think you need. 
not what you think you might stick handle past council. <laughs> Look ahead 50 years. Plan, plan what you want. And let's see what happens. So they did, and they got it. And, and it's still there 50 years later. And, and very functional. Too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the, the Civic Center, uh, the city had outgrown the old city hall. And uh, with the ferry dock closed, they were able to wheel and deal some of the property. And that's why it's located where it is. Mm -hmm. And it's a great symbol for the city. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that happened out of urban renewal was uh, Dr. Flutie had some visions of what might have happened in the James Street area. And it hasn't happened the way he foresaw it because private capital didn't answer the call. Mm. <laughs> they chose to invest elsewhere. Mm. And people blame Faludi that his ideas were wrong. I think his ideas were very sound. But it did need private capital to heed the call, and it didn't. Yeah. How, uh, his plan was, I, I think you could fairly call it ambitious, and, and maybe uh, he was looking at a, a larger city than now exists. He was, and uh, there's a table at the back of his plan which forecasts the city to be, I th I'm going back some now, I think he forecast it to be over 100,000 by the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And those statistics were not uh, plucked out of the air by Gene Faludi. Mm -hmm. Those were statistics from what was then called the Dominion Bureau of Statistics, now StatsCan, mm -hmm. and the major banks, and uh, Bell Telephone. He cites all the sources. That's where those projections of 100,000 population came from. So he was trying to plan a city that was going to grow and actually double in size by the year 2000. It didn't because the plant d development tapered out and eventually it uh, subsided somewhat. How, how much do you think uh, the city that we have today uh, reflects what, what he tried to uh, do and what you tried to, to make of his plans? Well, of course, the population didn't develop, so much of it didn't happen. Uh, another example of something that didn't happen, and and I was a proponent of this, is that we had done a traffic study, the Dillon study it was called, mm -hmm. and one of the major recommendations was to relocate the railroad north, somewhere in the second line area, and we could then create on that land a four-lane highway, because as the city grew, we saw the potential need for an underpass at the John Street crossing, Bruce Street, Pym Street, Lake Street, and there had been some experience with the underpass. It took forever to finish, it flooded and what have you. And uh, to create an underpass, you have to condemn land on either side of it. And we thought John Street's going to be a disaster if we have to create an underpass there. Bruce Street and the other streets wouldn't be easy. Moving the railway was going to give us a four-lane highway right through the city. You wouldn't have to have any underpasses because you could control traffic with lights. And it would also connect to the bridge, as Carmen's Way is intended to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't happen. Uh, it was something that came along later in my short term as mayor. Uh, my successors didn't pursue that. I don't blame them. They had other fish to fry. Mm -hmm. And they did what they did with the issues of the day. But that was an idea that a much larger city would have justified. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it could have been done under the... Uh, Federal r Railway Crossing Program would have paid for most of it. Oh. So uh, I liked the idea then, and if we were going to grow to a couple of hundred thousand, I still like the idea, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not beating the drum for it. And especially if you're stopped there waiting for a train. <laughs> yeah. You really like the idea. Um, one of the traffic things that was achieved, I think, out of that was uh, connecting uh, St. George's to McNabb. Is that... Uh, St. George's opened up. Yeah. Uh, we used to live on the second house below that hill, mm -hmm. and that's where the street terminated. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the streets that was opened up where St. Mary's College is now located and so on. Mm -hmm. And that does connect to McNabb at uh, Penn Street. Yeah. Were there any other uh, traffic things like that that were... 
Well, Jimmy Becking was uh, in the city engineer's department, and he had a real interest in traffic, and uh, he wound up in Ottawa working in that same field. And uh, at the time, we were not just trying to deal with the traffic issues of the day, but looking ahead to that projected growth in the population. Uh, a lot of the other achievements in terms of traffic movement were done long after my day, uh, the second line being a good example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that most of that was done in Joe Fratesi's day. And it is yet to be completed because eventually it's going to have to tie in with the uh, bypass around Garden River. Mm -hmm. And then you really have a much better system. Yeah. Um, you, you gave some of your reasons for, uh, for uh, packing it in as mayor uh, and, and uh, principal among them with family. Yeah. Um, there was also some suggestion, though, that you were going to be the next uh, federal uh, liberal member. Well, matter of fact, uh, I don't know whether this is a distinction or not, but I was invited by all three parties to run. <laughs> because in the last election I contested, I won every poll but one. My opponent won the poll in which he had been born and raised, so <laughs> neighborhoods count. And... Uh, so I get, you know, they looked at the arithmetic and said, well, this guy can get elected. Mm -hmm. But uh, working for the airline, I used to see the travel patterns of the members, both provincially and federally. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not leaving town on a Sunday night to come back on Friday night and spend all day Saturday and Sunday meeting my constituents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I've got six kids at home and I'm just not going to do that. So yeah. that was the end of that. Uh, okay. Um, but you've remained a, a strong uh, liberal, I believe, haven't you? I've been a grit all my life, but I was not active politically while I was in City Hall. No. Because on the one hand, I had to deal with the province, which was uh, conservative forever. I Actually, until David Orzetti. Mm -hmm. And the government of the day in Ottawa although we were represented by George Nixon, who won seven consecutive elections, mm -hmm. the government in Ottawa was under George Diefenbaker. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That was a kind of an interesting thing. Uh, one of the benefits I had while at City Hall was I was working for Air Canada, and I had a standing pass, a business pass, space available, and my boss allowed me to use that pass on city business. So... Uh, I thought nothing of making an appointment in Toronto and whipping down on a <laughs> flight in the morning, <laughs> seeing whoever and coming home the same night. I didn't even file expense accounts because in those days I went to the airport in Sioux, Michigan for nothing, flew for nothing. Sometimes I was met by a car that took me to whoever I was seeing in government. So I'd come home the same day and I hadn't spent any money. <laughs> uh, on one of those occasions, uh, we had started to build a sewage plant which was a big deal. It was very expensive. And where, where was that, the sewage plant? The east. The, the, the current location? Current yeah. location. Okay. And before that, we were polluting the river. That's where all the sewage went. It was not a good scene. And uh, Sioux, Michigan had already built a plant. And it was clear that uh, we were going to wind up in court. So uh, we were supposed to be sworn in on the second... Monday of January 1960. That was our st my first statutory meeting. So I called Dr. Berry at the Ontario Water Resources Commission. He was responsible for these things. Art Wishart was on his board. And I asked him if he could come to Sault Ste. Marie for our inaugural meeting. I want to make an impression on council that this was a priority. He said, no, I can't come on the second Monday, but I could come on the first. I said, fine. Our meeting starts at 10. So I arranged to be sworn in ahead of that first Monday, and we had a special meeting of council, and Dr. Berry made his pitch, and council approved it, and, and we got on with it. Well, after we let the contract, which was for millions, we found out that Sarnia was getting a million-dollar subsidy. We didn't even know there was a subsidy. <laughs> so Terry Murphy had introduced me to Arthur Maloney, who was a prominent Toronto lawyer. He used to come to the Sioux to defend in important cases. Mm. And he introduced me to Maloney, who was a member 
conservative member from Toronto Parkdale and a member of the Diefenbaker government. So uh, in the introduction, he said, if you ever want to see somebody in Ottawa, give me a call and I'll see if, see if I can help. So he gave me his mm -hmm. card. So when I heard about the Sarnia subsidy, I phoned him up. I said, I got to see Davy Walker. He was the Minister of Public Works, later a senator. I said, I got to talk about this sewage plant. We're on the hook for X millions, mm -hmm. and Sarnia's getting a subsidy, and we want one. He called me back in about an hour. He said, He'll see you on such and such a day. So, on my little pass, I flew to, <laughs> Ottawa, I flew to Ottawa, and I saw him, made my pitch, mm -hmm. and he said, Well, you got a strong case. You, I can't make a commitment. He said, I'll certainly look into it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to meet the Prime Minister. So from there, I go to the Prime Minister's office. He never mentioned the elections, but I heard that he was trolling for a candidate in this riding. And he was a very pleasant guy. And I, I had not met him before. This was Diefenbaker? Diefenbaker. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was just Diefenbaker and me in his office. And he was showing me little trinkets. He had a, he was a keen fisherman. And he had a fishing reel as a paperweight on his desk. And he had pictures of himself and dignitaries with the huge fish they caught, caught in these great lakes in northern Saskatchewan. And that was it. We just chatted back and forth. We never talked about the sewage plant or anything else. Well, from there, I went to, uh, to see the new city hall. Ottawa I just built a new city hall. So I walked to the new city hall. And I was on the main floor looking around, and a commissioner came up to me. He said, what are you up to? I said, well, <laughs> I live in Sault Ste. Marie, and I'm, I'm the mayor of the city, and you've got a nice new building here, and we need one. It's not a priority, but we've got to do something about it. And I thought, I might as well have a look at the newest new city hall. He said, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. So he came back. He had in tow Charlotte Witten, who was the mayor of <laughs> Ottawa. So I introduced myself. And she gave me a tour of the building. And after that, she said, well, where are you going from here? I said, I'm going straight to the airport and I'm going home. She said, we'll give you a ride. My car will be at the front door. So <laughs> I got in the mayor's car, was driven to the irony of it, of it to this day amuses me. I was driven to the door of the airport, <clears throat> thanked the chauffeur very much. Proceeded to the counter, flashed my pass, and flew home for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, those were some of the things that I could do with that free ride. And mm -hmm. I had a few other experiences. I, I once flew to Toronto to talk to Imperial Oil. I had an appointment with the top brass on their office building on Eglinton Avenue. And my pitch was they had to get rid of that oil tank between the hospitals. And they should build a pipeline and pump the oil from the dock, then the government dock, up to somewhere east of the Black Road. Well, he looked at me like I'd come from some other planet. <laughs> Didn't think that was much of an idea. Well, too many years later, they did exactly that, <laughs> yes. long after I was gone. <laughs> and another time I went to Toronto, and I had a hard time getting an appointment with the senior vice president of the Canadian Pacific Railway. I could have got to see the Pope easier, but finally I got this appointment. Down I go on the plane, over to Union Station. So I'm telling him about the Dilling Report, and we want to relocate his railway right up <laughs> town. But we don't want to be enemies on this. This is a partnership. We want you to support this. And he sort of nodded at me and made no commitments and ushered me out the door. <laughs> Uh, that thing never happened. Uh, uh, and where did you want to relocate it to? Oh, somewhere north of the second it, line. Just get it out of town. You weren't particular. <laughs> Just anywhere out of where it was. Because yeah. ambulances, fire trucks, and you mm -hmm. name it, were mm -hmm. held up mm -hmm. by trains shunting back and forth. Mm -hmm. Probably still are. <laughs> <laughs> um, what... Uh, so you worked at Algoma Steel for uh, 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Um, what, what positions did you hold there? I was, well, at first I was called an assistant superintendent and then a manager. There were three managers under the general manager, mm -hmm. but it's in human resources. Mm -hmm. And I answered the media questions and dealt with the press and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. 
And what what are your uh, thoughts on the rise and fall and uh, I guess roller coaster <laughs> of Algoma Steel over the years? Well, it was still going pretty good when I left in '86. Uh, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, a lot of what happened at the plant was the result of contract settlements, which they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. And they were made because the plant was struck and shut down, and they couldn't keep it shut down forever. I think that made a major contribution to what happened to the plant. You know, they had to sell off the tube mill, and sell their coal mines and whatnot. I, I retired in 86, and all of this happened afterwards. But uh, I just know that from the outside. Uh, mm -hmm. I was there from 66 to 86. And uh, during that period, uh, the plant was investing a lot of money. One year, they invested about a million dollars a day. I think they spent over $300 million on expansion in one year. And that was a very heady period. Mm -hmm. uh, the business is cyclical, and everybody and his cousin makes steel. Uh, you know, you can buy steel from anywhere in, on the planet. Uh, wasn't always that way. Hmm. So it's become a very, very difficult business. Uh, I think we're blessed to have an international ownership hmm. because we now sell steel offshore. And I think it's been very helpful. And this is a huge organization. I think they grow something like 18 billion. So mm -hmm. we're not playing with, uh, with amateurs here. Uh, I don't know these people. Uh, I've been in and out of the plant a couple of times on a tour, mm. but uh, what I know about it now is from a distance, I'll mm -hmm. tell you. Yeah. And in, in your day as mayor, the Algoma Steel was hugely important to the city. It's still important, but uh, do you uh, feel that the city's done a, a decent job uh, uh, adapting to to the fact that uh, Algoma Steel isn't uh, carrying <laughs> the load? Well, I, as, you know, as far as the city, the, the councils and the administration, you know, I, th I think they've dealt with the problems of their day mm -hmm. and they've done it adequately. Uh, mm -hmm. The city has no direct influence on the success or failure of the steel plant. Mm -hmm. It was a huge force. Uh, it depends who you talk to when you speak about average employment. I think when you eliminate the employment that was outside of the city, such as the mines in West Virginia or Wawa, or the Canadian Furnace at Port Colborne, sales offices around the country, the employment and, and the huge construction force that was at the plant year in and year out, I think the average employment over the years was probably around 8,500. Well, now it's around 3,000. And those were among the highest paid, average paid jobs in Canada. I think we used to compete with Sarnia. Hmm. Well, that isn't the way it is now. Hmm. The pay, I think, is, is adequate. They're paid better than a lot of other people. But the workforce is about a third of what it used to be. Hmm. I think the future looks good because of today's ownership. Hmm. Do you think when... Your council thought were able to dream big. Do you think that it was because of this, the things like the the average wage being so high in town and that sort of prosperity? I think uh, you could afford to think bigger then than you could now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we had one collegiate, one tech. That was it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, f from those roots, uh, we had no St. Mary's College. We had no other Catholic high school. We didn't have White Pines, Sir James Dunn, Bawading, Cora. Uh, I think when I was there in the 60s, the city was still recuperating from its depression history. Hmm. Uh, I think people were always waiting for the day when the plant would be shut for a couple of months till they got the next order. Hmm. Well, that, that wasn't what happened. Uh, a lot of people wrote off some of these ideas about what could happen in the future. You know, they thought we were a little bit uh, <laughs> nuts. These ideas were too big. But uh, given the times, I think 
It was the time to think big. Hmm. Hmm. Um, in your other uh, uh, employment with, uh, well, tra it was Trans Canada yeah. originally, and then yeah. Air Canada, we went from uh, flying out of uh, the states to having our own airport. Yeah. Uh, how, how much uh, did you have to do with that sort of development and the development of Air Canada here? Just about nothing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I was a bystander. Uh, the airport was a decision of the federal government mm -hmm. that it was time that a city of this size had, size had its own airport. Mm. Uh, we were welcome at what later became a, a SAC base uh, at Kinchlow, mm. and we flew there for 14 years. <laughs> but uh, the city had practically nothing to do with it, and I as an employee was just... Uh, one of the minions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, did you, uh, did I, did Air Canada grow uh, significantly while it was here in the city or under your managing, your managership? Well, when I first came here and I was introduced at my boarding house to the lady's son, mm -hmm. he said, oh, you're with the airline. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I hope you don't get to like this place because flying will never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> so I had fair warning that I should keep my bag half packed. Uh, no, it, it, it succeeded quite well. Mm -hmm. It had no competition at the time mm -hmm. and uh, the, air, the airline industry was changing. Mm -hmm. No, we were getting uh, uh, the bi count and then jets and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. It was onward and upward. Mm -hmm. What um what would you, how, how would you appraise what your legacy is in this city? Well, I think I said earlier that you're here to make a difference, and I think I made a difference. Mm -hmm. Do you think the city uh, remembers people? I know you've, you've written uh, about, uh, for example, you wrote a letter to the editor about uh, the high school not uh, being named after <laughs> after uh, a person and being named yeah, after, yeah. which is a sentiment I share. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you feel like you're recognized by the city properly? No, I think I, I know I get respect uh, where where I go. Uh, mm. I try to try to stay out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't express my opinion as often as I'm tempted mm -hmm. to do because I think that a lot of people that write regularly don't have a whole lot to offer. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be lumped in as some kind of a kook <laughs> that only knows the address of the editor of the Sue Daily Star. <laughs> so, uh, like for instance, right now, mm -hmm. I'm sorely tempted to write about the group that considers themselves knowledgeable and loyal hockey fans. <laughs> the fact is, they only support the Greyhounds win or tie. Mm -hmm. If they lose, everything's wrong. <laughs> and uh, they, they criticize everything right down to the pizza and the popcorn. Mm. And I think the true fan sticks with it through thick and thin. Better days are coming. Mm -hmm. I'm buying another season ticket even though because of low vision I don't see the puck. I can't read the names on the jerseys. In fact, now I can't read their numbers. Mm. But I can see them move around <laughs> and we're seeing first class hockey. Mm -hmm. So those who are willing to pack it in, in my opinion, are not true hockey fans. <laughs> I'm not writing that letter. Okay. <laughs> um, any regrets that you uh, came here from Winnipeg years and years and years? Oh ago? no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, when you think about it, uh, you know, I was here at age 20, single, mm. and what would happen to me if I'd been transferred somewhere else? Who knows? Mm. But uh, I mean, I I met my wife here and. My kids are all born here. Four of my daughters, my four daughters, all live here. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've met every prime minister and every premier. The only prime minister I never met was Bob Ray, and I'm a real fan of this guy. <laughs> I am. I was a fan when he was the NDP premier. Mm. I think he's bright and he's got a lot to offer. But I met the prime ministers and the premiers and who have you. Uh, I would never have done that somewhere else. I was being interviewed 
the year after I was out of City Hall and before I went to the steel plant to be transferred here and there. And I traveled here and there for interviews, but I didn't want any part of it. I had seen what happened to the man who brought me here, which was Grant McClarty. He left a son at McGill when he was transferred out of Montreal. I think he left a daughter in Vancouver when he was transferred to New York and so on. And I wasn't going to move around the countryside and leave a child here and a child there. Mm. So no regrets, and I don't think the city has any regrets that, that you came here either. <laughs> so thanks very much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay. It was a pleasure. <laughs>